Tonight, I have gathered two opposing factions, a vampire church that likes to play with fire, and a group of baby bats ready to leave their mark, to bring you a review of The Crimson Gutter, a book for Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition. <laughs> This is a book review. As a reminder of how I do book reviews is I don't rate them or say if they're good or bad. It doesn't really make sense for a TTRPG. Instead, I think it's a lot more useful to explain what the book is, what the book intends to do, and if it accomplishes what it sets out to do. Then I'll sort of do a dive and really dig in sort of chapter by chapter, breaking down what you can expect to find in the book. And then finally, I'll give sort of my personal opinions and recommendations for anyone who sticks around that long or cares. So without further ado, uh, let's do it. The Crimson Gutter is a chronicle for Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition. What that means, if you're more familiar with some other game turns, is it's like a campaign, uh, a module, if you will. So this book is intended to be able to be used to run uh, a pretty lengthy, significant story in Vampire the Masquerade. This book contains 21 different stories that can be linked together to create a chronicle that's designed to take the players from freshly embraced kindred uh, all the way to a coterie that has their own domain and the backing of a sect. It also contains settings and NPCs, uh, all designed to be fairly adaptable so they can be used sort of in any chronicle, not just this. It also contains a lot of storytelling advice, most of it quite specific to this chronicle, but because this chronicle covers a lot of the, the core concepts of Vampire the Masquerade, the advice will carry over to have a lot of general purpose as well. There are also sections that have complications associated with the different predator types. There's a section with sort of plug and play scenes and stories associated with those as well as a section with future stories, if you want to continue on past this chronicle or weave it into a larger story. The intention of the book. This particular chronicle is designed to be a source so storytellers can introduce players to a lot of the core concepts and themes of Vampire the Masquerade. It's specifically an introductory chronicle uh, designed for the characters to be new vampires, and the players can learn a lot about the game and the system and the setting and lore through gameplay. It lets players experience things like hunting and feeding, uh, an understanding of kind of firsthand experience of the different sects, uh, as well as acquiring and maintaining a domain as a coterie. The Chronicle is also designed to be highly adaptable and modular, like they said. So it doesn't name a specific city. Instead, it's designed to be able to sort of be just generic enough to be plugged into any major city or to be part of a fictional one you make up on your own. Ultimately, the book is designed to fill what I think is a much needed role for Vampire the Masquerade, and that's uh, to be a resource for new storytellers or old ones to introduce uh, new players to Vampire the Masquerade, covering all the core concepts uh, and having kind of a full chronicle because my one shots are certainly viable and a lot of fun. Um, me personally, I think the you're really going to get into the meat of the game by being able to spend time with your characters and develop those arcs and get into the narrative. So this lets you do that. So does it accomplish what it sets out to do? I believe it does. Uh, I would have loved this when I was a new storyteller. Uh, I think Vampire the Masquerade doesn't lend itself to modules and sort of like chronicle books nearly as much as a lot of other TTRPGs mainly for reasons of why I prefer this over a lot of other TTRPGs. A big reason for that is because it lends itself so much to the players and the character choices uh, leading the narrative or altering the narrative. And again, it's a, a game of political and personal horror. It's hard to write a big chronicle or story that is perfectly going to reflect the personal motivations and plights of the individual characters without just creating premades for them. This book does that in what I think is a pretty clever way, which is instead of just having one linear storyline, they have a bunch of individual stories that all work together to create one chronicle, but the order can be messed with a little bit in times, and also it gives room for things to happen in between, for character narratives to 
direct things. It's it's very hard to ruin this story because of how it's set up. And all this is great for the players, but again, this is supposed to make it easier for a storyteller um, to run the story. And I think it does that as well. Again, these individual stories really take away um, a lot of the prep that might otherwise be acquired, or at the very least gives pretty clear directions and really good advice, which is something a lot of modules and campaign books I've read don't do. It's just directly talk to the storyteller and say, hey, uh, in this instance, you might want to try this out, or here's a complication you might run into if this happens, think of it this way, and to keep sort of goals in mind rather than just laying out a narrative and letting you interpret it as you need to. And because it is a collection of uh, smaller stories, the storyteller doesn't have to read the whole thing front to back um, to prepare to run it. They really can sort of take it a chunk at a time and adjust as they go. And the players are still allowed plenty of agency, more than you'll find in a lot of other games and especially running campaigns because it's designed to be adaptable, modular, and to it's designed to be affected by the player's actions. The point of the stories is really smart too. They're designed to sort of cover, again, core concepts, core themes of the game, rather than tell a very specific narrative that has to unfold a certain way. This book is also organized in a way that allows the storytellers to easily reference things. This is something that uh, Vampire the Masquerade has struggled with before. Some of these books are a little hard to flip around and reference, reference certain rules and things like that. Uh, they do it in a good way to where all the locations are in one section, all the NPCs are in one section. So again, thing with a big chronicle, it might be hard to remember, okay, where did this NPC pop up or where did they mention this setting? Now, very easy to find them, uh, which is a huge blessing for a storyteller. Because Vampire the Masquerade's typically set in you know, a living, changing city, it's not something that where like the coterie is going to interact with a person or a place and then check that box off and move on. A lot of times they'll be returning to these people or places. So it's nice to have sections where you can easily reference them. And it's also designed where the storyteller only needs the core book uh, to be able to run this chronicle. Even though there's lots of other books out there, they specifically kept in mind if you just have the core book in this, you're good to go. Uh, they do have options on how to expand it with things from the player's guide as well, which is really nice that they kept that in mind for a little bit more of the complete experience, um, but also aren't forcing you to buy two more books to be able to run this book. You have the main book, you have this, you got a vampire chronicle. Overall, if you're a new storyteller or just a storyteller looking to have a resource to help uh, take some of the prep work off your plate or to be able to have things to inspire or plug into your own chronicle. I think this is an excellent book, especially if you have a group of players that are brand new to the game uh, that really, really raises the, the value of what you'll get from this. The writers clearly understand the game, understand the concepts and the themes that make Vampire the Masquerade uh, fifth edition what it is. They do a really good job of laying those out, making them interesting and memorable while also not so specific to where they're going to be, they're going to stifle any player creativity. So if you run this chronicle, you're going to have all the means to tell a classic Vampire the Masquerade story with plenty of room to add your own flair as well. Now, if you're a seasoned storyteller and you're already running your own chronicle or you're someone who really likes to build it from the ground up um, and inspired to do something very specific, there's not a ton you'll get out of this book. There aren't any major mechanical changes or huge references to uh, be able to use or things like that. Though, if you're someone who likes to be able to read things for inspiration or you just want to sort of m scrap this for parts, uh, it certainly is useful in that regard. What might be interesting for veterans is that the Church of Cain is presented as a joinable sect or faction where there's a Camry and Anarchs, and the Church of Cain is sort of an in-between where you can belong to one of them and the Church of Cain. That's a concept where this was already explored in Cults of the Blood Gods and some of the books that went along with that. But this is the first time I think it's really presented in this way. So that could be an interesting thing to check out if you're really a, a lore enthusiast who wants to just sort of uh, take in all of that. 
I personally got a lot of use out of the feeding complications section too. Again, it's things that you can come up with if, if again, if you're a seasoned storyteller and you're not lacking for inspiration, but it definitely has some kind of interesting scenarios that you could just grab from to make a normal feeding scene ha have a little bit extra something going on for uh, when you need it. So basically, uh, its goal is to provide a chronicle for new storytellers or old storytellers to introduce uh, a classic Vampire the Masquerade game, hitting all the, the main parts uh, of the setting and lore. And if that's its goal, it accomplishes that goal, as simple as that. So if that's also your goal, is to tell an introductory story, um, introducing characters as new kindred, and then kind of taking them through joining a sect, learning about the sex, getting a domain of their own, uh, understanding sort of the dangers of the beast and balancing their humanity. Um, all of that's available for you in this. So if that sounds like something you're interested in or would like a great resource to do a lot of the work for you, this is your book. Now we'll do a chapter by chapter dive. This is where I will look deeper in the book. Uh, I'll kind of go not only chapter by chapter, but like section by section in the individual chapters and tell you what they're about, what's in it, what you can expect to find. If you think you'll be playing in a Chronicle that uses this book, this might not have spoilers specifically, but it'll definitely ruin a little bit of the magic. So you probably shouldn't watch. Um, but also that's why up front, I kind of give you all the main points. If you just want to know if you should get the book or not, or if it's relevant to you, I've covered that. If I was better at this whole algorithm thing, I would have hid that, or I would tell you to keep watching, but I, uh, I don't know. I'm not good at that. That's my problem. So if you're a player, you think you're going to play in this, congratulations, you're finished with the video. Um, if you're a storyteller who really wants to know kind of precisely what you can expect or just curious, uh, watch on. I can't tell you what to do. I can't. I just did, but I can't stop you. We'll start with the introduction. So this book starts out with a section called The Story. This explains how to use the book. Uh, it calls itself a, a toolbox with everything you need to run an easily customizable chronicle. Um, again, it's that more so than a module contended for a single coherent story. And in fact, all the stories involved are can, can kind of be ran as modules. They're all designed where it says you might be able to run each of them in a single session. But of course, I acknowledge that that's very much dependent on you, you as a storyteller, as well as the player's actions and things like that. They don't have to be done in a session, but the intent is that they can be. This book, like pretty much every Vampire the Masquerade book, contains a lot of snippets and blurbs that are sort of uh, in character, uh, where there's little sections where you'll get quotes or little stories that either involve the Chronicle or are direct quotes from different NPCs in the Chronicle. So those are always fun to read, and especially... In this instance, since you're actually going to be interacting and using the characters that are speaking uh, in these little sections, uh, could really be useful for kind of storytelling tools to help understand those NPCs. The first section is called Your Story. This explains how to use the book and sort of just, again, talks to you directly as a storyteller. And then it also calls itself a toolbox that can be used to make an easily customizable chronicle uh, rather than be intended to tell one linear story. It talks about how the stories presented in this book are meant or can be run in a single session, uh, though it also acknowledges that that obviously can change depending on their storyteller style or the player's choices. And it also acknowledges that depending on their actions, um, some stories might be discarded uh, while others may be rearranged and things like that. These stories intersect with scenes that are guided by the characters, your players. So the goals of the players are, are still the driving force behind the Chronicle. The, that's what takes precedence. Uh, they interweave with the stories that this book gives you rather than the player motivations and character actions taking a backseat to it. So I think that's really well done. This section also gives a quick summary of all the following chapters and emphasizes that they could be repurposed or changed um, depending on your needs. There's a section on domains. This explains what a domain is in Vampire the Masquerade terms 
and also explains that in this chronicle, domains can be used to show sort of the differences of the factions as well. Uh, the point of this chronicle, uh, the idea is that your coterie will eventually get a domain of their own. So it talks about that. It also mentions how the settings and domains and things like that are purposely non-specific or like they're specific locations, but they're not, don't need to be in a specific city. That way you can plug it into your own city or setting or be able to just make up a fictional one if you need to. There's a section called reasons to join. I think this is a, a really good section. Um, I feel like not enough books and modules talk about uh, player buy-in. So they acknowledge that and talk about, uh, they give advice on how to sort of guide your coterie into joining one of the sects is again, that's sort of a, one of the points of this chronicle. It also acknowledges that all these sects are purposely flawed. Uh, this seems to be a reoccurring thing in a lot of games is your, your, the players I've seen it, uh, I, I've experienced it myself and I've seen it in a lot of other games and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but a lot of times they'll see like, oh, the Anarchs have these problems, the like Camarilla have these problems, let's do our own thing. Huge lofty goal, um, really, um, but a, a fun one to pursue. So it, again, it was something a little hard for brand new players maybe to tackle. And it's also sort of the point of the setting is that these are flawed organizations or ideals or movements um, rather than you playing an unflawed uh, character, it's kind of leans into the mess of it all. But the challenge then is that how do you get players to join a group uh, that they can easily identify their flaws and they give really good advice on how to do that. Again, without necessarily strong arming them or forcing them, you want them to understand the necessity or where they can align rather than just uh, try to look for a, a, a perfect faction and things like that. It does a really good job of exploring some of those themes. And also acknowledges that if the, the players feel forced to join one group or another, they're just not really going to have that same level of investment. And it's a really good thing to acknowledge and think about as well. And again, this is what I was talking about, where even if you're not running this chronicle specifically, it's great advice and sort of covers some things. Again, it's talking to you directly as a storyteller in a way that some of the other books, even the core book, doesn't do as much. So it's really useful, just general advice uh, for any storyteller, but especially a new one. And because this book is just talking to you as a person, uh, does a good job of giving advice, like just discussing with your players rather than just giving you advice to be used as a storyteller in the game. We'll talk about like, just talk to your players, discuss with them, let them know what the concept of the Chronicle is so you can get buy-in from them and they can make characters and make decisions with that sort of meta in mind without being too restricted by it. This sounds like very obvious advice and I promise you it does not happen enough to where storytellers make their intentions clear and also that players bother to actually uh, keep sort of the overall intentions in mind when playing or making their characters. Then there's a little section for each of the sects that you'll be running into, the Anarchs, the Camarilla, the Church of Cain, uh, with little bullet points just kind of explaining why the characters might want to join those groups, basically kind of summing up what they're all about and giving them uh, what the benefits would be of joining them. Then there's a section called Sacrificial Lambs. This is another interesting, basically, storyteller advice section that's applicable to this chronicle, but also overall. The idea is that you can kind of help narratively uh, get the characters to understand the benefits of joining a sect by having another group show what happens when you're not in a sect. Um, or if your coterie fully is invested in a sect and maybe you need some help showing the flaws of the group they're in. You can use the, the sacrificial lamb group, as they call it, to show what happens when, uh, show the dark side of the group they're in as well. Really interesting concept, and I think a good narrative tool to use. Chapter one, waking up in the gutter. This chapter covers character creation. It covers supporting characters, has a section for anarch gang bosses, as well as a section with locations. Character creation. So this section cover, uh, sort of explains how that the Chronicle starts with a group of fledglings or uh, very newly turned vampires. Now this Chronicle doesn't cover the actual embrace itself, 
Um, it assumes that the characters have a very basic understanding of their existence and what it means. It doesn't go through the whole, what am I? What do I do? Oh no, I need blood type of thing. Uh, it assumes they figured out again, that kind of the core parts of their existence and their curse. Um, but it also assumes that they have a lot to learn, uh, especially about how to conduct themselves in vampire society. It also talks about some adjustments that should be made to the standard character creation process um, and advice for helping the players um, build characters that will fit in really well with this chronicle. And really, the restrictions just make sense. But if, again, you have a player who just doesn't understand, or refuses to have, any, like, it's in the book, I'm going to use it, you can't tell me how to make a character, I shouldn't have any restrictions. If you're of that mindset, um, what a great way to just learn right off the bat, not to bother with someone as a player. Um, I don't know, that's, that's a whole other thing. That could be a whole other video. Uh, but anyway, the restrictions are things like uh, don't use backgrounds and merits that already have them established in a certain faction and things like that. Because again, you're going to be gaining a faction or choosing a faction throughout the Chronicle. So don't start out with one. It also kind of has restrictions on things like not having them take like resources five you don't or fame super high or things like that again this is a kind of a street level um introductory chronicle so they're learning the ropes these characters come in and they're some of the wealthiest famous people in the world and things like that that's kind of a different story it also does a really cool thing which is just gives you just straightforward advice for things like hey these are some skills that like some of the players should definitely probably have um because they'll be used a lot or these predator types just don't really work out with the concept, so avoid these if you can. Just, again, not necessarily hard rules, but just, again, just like talking to you as a storyteller and a person's suggestions on uh, what to do during character creation. The biggest change to the character creation process is the predator types. Uh, they do actually a really cool thing that, uh, especially for brand new players that I like, which is, they have you learn your predator type um, narratively through play, which we'll cover in, I'll talk about that when we get to the story that actually does that. And I think it works out really well. This also has a list of sires to choose from. So again, the idea is they don't have a sire that's super involved and is sort of slowly and carefully teaching them step by step. They're le learning a lot of this on their own or as a coterie. So. This list is nice because it gives you sires that are part of the game. They're NPCs included in the Chronicle. Uh, so they're still around. That dynamic, that sire dynamic can still be explored. But they're all created in a way that also gives them reasons uh, why they weren't great sires or they didn't stick around or weren't super involved in the process. An interesting thing they do here is because, again, this is designed to where if you only have the core book, you're good to go. But they also give you the options that are in the player's guide, which means if you pick a sire that's m one of the options for one of the core book clans, um, they also have options on how they could be used for the uh, expanded clans as well, which also touches on one of my character creation personal philosophies, which is where not everyone needs to be a perfect stereotype of their clan. Uh, this straight up acknowledges that by saying we created a person, a character, um, we could see them as this clan or that clan, depending on what works for your story. Beautiful. Then there's a couple tables where if the players kind of want help or direction, um, they can select from these tables that one is, uh, gives them options on how they were embraced. Uh, the other gives options on what their sort of general outlook on being a vampire is and what inspired that. Uh, so again, they're, the characters are allowed to do what they want. There's not pre-mades in this, um, but there's options to help narrow it down and if your players need a little bit of direction and one options that really work thematically with the Chronicle and Vampire, the Masquerade in general. There's also a list of questions that you as a storyteller should be asking the players or can. Um, I recommend using them. That just helps discuss as a group um, what the coterie is and what the purpose of it is and things like that. Then there's a supporting character section. Um, this gives a couple tables, one that has all the different factions and then the supporting characters that are involved in each one. And then just a list of all the supporting characters. 
with little quick, to, easy to reference information about each of them. Um, the factions are the uh, Tarkis, the Anarchs, the Camarilla, the Church of Cain. Um, again, these sections, this is a, another thing they did right, which is they keeping the storyteller in mind and creating really easy to reference um, tools for them. And then there's a section for each um, NPC. And we'll pull one up. We'll, I'll show you an example one. We'll kind of go through um, what those look like piece by piece. So let's look at Robert Vasile, the lone gentleman. Uh, we see his Camarilla, his 12th generation Ventru, um, and Scylla. We have Zemitsu there in parentheses because, again, if you're using the player's guide and Zemitsu are involved, or you have a character as a Zemitsu, this could be an option for them as their sire. Um, also means you can just choose for them to be one or the other, depending on what works best for what you have in mind for the Chronicle. Also, don't forget that Zemitsu, Ravnos, and Salubri are available in the free Vampire Companion. So even if you just have the core book, you can still download that PDF and add three more clan options. Then, of course, we have a little bio, uh, covers just a, a bit of their backstory, and also gives you maybe the reputation or uh, what others think about them in the city. Then we have their stats, of course. Again, easy to reference um, for the storyteller. Uh, note the disciplines. So it gives you two different discipline spreads. One, if you're playing them as Venture, another, if you're playing them as Zemitsi. You'll see these for any of the SPCs that can be either or. There's an appearance section, which Self-explanatory, gives you a little bit about their appearance, and you have a nice picture to show too if you want. In play is an interesting section, because again, this is referencing, or this is talking to you as a storyteller, giving you sort of hints on uh, how to portray them in your game. Locations, this is where they'll likely be found within this setting. Again, these tie into the locations that they give you in the book, so it's really easy to grab an NPC, grab the location that they're in, and get a scene going. As a sire, this explains what this character uh, would be like as a sire, and ex usually explains why they weren't uh, the most uh, attentive sire. Again, this is really only relevant if one of your characters um, is the childer of this one. Betrayal section is interesting, too. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that they will betray the Coterie. Every single uh, NPC has a betrayal section. More, this is an option of if you want them as an enemy or how they might become an antagonist to your Coterie, um, which I like for a couple reasons. One, it just shows that uh, in this setting, in this world, everyone's a potential enemy. Um, and also, it just kind of gives an interesting options of players like to make enemies of whoever so sometimes someone you didn't intend to be an enemy might become one whether uh that's your choice or not so this will let you sort of switch things up and start playing them as an antagonist if you need to there's the anarch gang bosses section this just has three more characters that are anarch gang bosses these aren't options as sires so i think that's why they have their own section and they don't have an as a sire part in their little blurb uh, these are the older and these are the most well, politically and kind of mechanically powerful NPCs in the game. So they're sort of their own thing. Then there's a locations section. There are eight locations. Each is a description of the location, factions associated with it, the NPCs that can be found there, as well as a mechanics and development section. The mechanics are a really cool touch, actually. These, uh, give sort of different mechanical flares, a lot of times kind of bonuses, where in this setting you'll have a bonus to persuasion or something like that because of this reason. I think that's a really cool way to sort of uh, emphasize certain locations' significance and also kind of works for a sort of reward for the players who invest in sort of uh, maintaining a good standing with certain locations or developing their own. Uh, I like things that sort of anchor the narrative uh, into a little bit of a mechanical flair. The development part of location is a really good tool for storytellers. And again, just sort of a good way to think of locations in general. They give you examples on how this place could evolve or change. Because again, 
uh, Vampire the Masquerade should take place in a constantly shifting or uh, developing setting that just because your coterie is not uh, interfering or interacting with something doesn't mean it's just stagnant. Uh, so this kind of gives options on if nothing happens, uh, it might evolve this way or that might take a turn for the worse this way. So really cool way to uh, get kind of more out of just these stagnant locations or places that would otherwise be stagnant locations. There's a section called Horror in the Crimson Gutter. This explains how personal horror is sort of baked into the Vampire the Masquerade settings. It also gives some questions that you as a storyteller can ask your players to sort of amp up the horror or get the characters to explore more of the personal horror aspects of the game. There's a community horror section. This explains how political horror comes into play and gives some examples of how there's a, these opposing ideals uh, for the uh, faction specifically of how they present themselves versus uh, the reality of how they are. Both very useful for this chronicle specifically and also just useful things to keep in mind as they're applicable to anyone running any chronicle of Vampire the Masquerade. Chapter 2, First Steps. This is the first chapter that is a collection of stories. Uh, these stories have the Coterie learning how to hunt, uh, the dangers of hunger, um, it has them clear their name and learning that fellow kindred can always be trusted. It has them dealing with the white and learning what happens when uh, mortal connections are left behind. It has them exposing some kindred secrets as well as uh, racing against other groups to take down a dangerous foe. There's a section called Explainer Characters which is a concept that's pretty much most uh, TTRPGs can use, but again, a thing that assumes not only that you might just be new to Vampire, but I kind of like that they have things like this that maybe you're just new to TTRPGs in general. So something like this could be helpful. Uh, basically, an explainer character is a character that can be used to explain certain themes or lore or exposition and things like that, how to build that into the narrative. The section called Vampire 101. This gives advice on how to run some of the kind of basic themes and concepts in Vampire the Masquerade. Specifically, it talks about feeding. Uh, this is where they cover assigning predator types. What they do is introduce a bit of an open-ended uh, feeding scene. And the players and their characters um, decide what they do to feed, to get blood. And, of course, you facilitate as a storyteller. And at the conclusion of that is when you can kind of, based on how they fed, you can then assign them predator types or really discuss with the players and introduce the predator types and show them like, okay, you fed this way, that kind of falls into this or maybe multiple options. They ultimately have the choice, of course, but it's kind of a cool way to just them to see what they do, see how they feed and almost like learn their predator type by being thrown into it. I think this is a really cool way to do that. And also a way that's very authentic to the narrative first, the character first, character creation style, which I prefer, rather than mechanics first. There's a section called Storytelling a Big Social Scene, which tells you how to storytell a big social scene. Things where you have multiple NPCs and uh, talking at once and things of that nature. Again, useful not just for vampire, but for just running a game in general. Then they get into the actual stories. So I'm not going to tell you what every story is. I kind of did it at the beginning. I give you a rough idea of what they are. Um, but I do think we should look at the structure, how they lay out each of the stories, and uh, dive into that a little bit. So we have the title and log line. This is Bring on the Night, Feeding Gone Awry. Um, usually these are just a few words. Uh, kind of useful. I think this is for like reference purposes. Again, storyteller can easily... And a couple lines or a couple words probably be like, oh, yeah, this is this story or that story. So I think that's just a thing to make it very easy to find certain stories for storytellers. Then there's attributes. This is interesting because it sort of breaks up the story um, like a character sheet in the different trait categories. There's physical, social, mental. This gives you an idea of the general approach and feel of this particular story. Um, it could have a combination of them or like in our example here where it has physicals optional. Uh, some of them also say possible, meaning in our example, it'll most likely be different social skills. And that's the general vibe of the story. But there's a 
an option to solve the problems or get through the scenario using a, a physical way. Then there's a summary. This is a quick, usually a couple paragraphs. That, again, just gives you a rough breakdown of the story as a whole. In this section, if there's a particular order or place that this story should go into in regards to some of the other stories, it'll also note that here. There's a why the player's coterie section. I think this is a really good addition. And this is a question that comes up, not just in Vampire the Masquerade, but a lot of different TTRPGs deal with this. Uh, I'm sure every storyteller or DM or GM or whatever, unless you're very lucky, have dealt with some variation of a player or group um, kind of pushing back of like, why do I care about this? Why should I do this? Again, it's, there's a few things going on with that. Usually, again, players like understand what you're doing, have some buy-in and things like that. But also a good storyteller is going to make the story sort of hopefully line up or make sense for character motivations or necessity. Now, Vampire the Masquerade is particularly vulnerable, I think, to this. Um, why it's difficult to make a module for it because it's a game that focuses on personal horror, horror on character motivations and uh, specific narrative arcs driven by the uh, coterie and character's actions. Because of that, it's hard for a module to sort of compete with the motivation level that the characters will have for their sort of personal desires and ambitions. So this section is very useful for Again, the, giving advice on why the coterie or characters would be involved in this particular story. And best part is there's usually multiple options too. So it's not just like, hey, they should do this because of this one reason. Uh, a lot of times they can come up with multiple reasons that could make sense. So you can find the right approach that works for your group if you need this. There's a goal section. Uh, again, I really like what they do here for the storyteller. While it has the goals that the characters will be trying to achieve, which is obviously useful. Uh, a lot of times this also gives goals for the storyteller, like what you should be wanting to get out of this scene or try to emulate with this scene. There'll be examples like this scene, um, a goal of yours is should really let the players play around and experiment with their disciplines or uh, really let them dive into the, the mystery aspects or this thematic thing gives a really good thing to where I, I wish more modules would do. I think it's an interesting design concept of a lot of times modules will be like the, the goal for the storyteller is to uh, progress the plot. Like a lot of people get stuck in like plot progression and just make sure we're always moving forward in a story rather than like sometimes these moments of that feels like being sidetracked or uh, distracted or backstory it doesn't have to be backstory a lot of that it's it's all progression it's all narrative it's all collaborative storytelling um so again playing a story with a goal in mind that goal being what you as a storyteller should be trying to uh, do for your players and their characters it's a really good way of looking at things there's sections for support characters and locations again this is just a nice reference for the storyteller to be able to quickly understand the locations and the NPCs that they'll probably want to look up or freshen up on because they'll likely be included in the story. Uh, it doesn't go full into the details of the characters. You'll still have to reference those or the settings. Uh, but it's nice where it's not just a list either. It gives you a, a little blurb about what part they're playing in this particular story. Then the story is broken down into scenes. This is a mechanic that uh, well, all the storyteller system uses where... Again, a scene can be any stretch of time or whatever, but um, makes sense that this is how they break down their, their smaller contained stories into multiple scenes. Usually each scene has two to three paragraphs sort of uh, describing how to run that scene. Some are also listed as optional. Um, and then usually it ends with an aftermath section, which will have uh, a lot of if-then scenarios. Where like if this happened during the story, uh, then this could be a result and things like that. And useful for it already predicts potential multiple outcomes for each story. The scenes themselves don't have a lot of lengthy, um, like the descriptions or exposition or things like that. They usually kind of give you what you as a storyteller need, um, kind of handles the mechanics for you. It'll give you sort of some quick things to establish the scene, um, and then it'll give you some potential dice rolls that'll happen and difficulty checks and things like that. Stuff that a new storyteller. Uh, would find most useful. It 
still leaves plenty of room purposely for you as a storyteller to expand on that scene, add your details, flesh it out, and things like that. It's not going to give you just long, read this description, and then read all these quotes of what characters are saying or anything like that. Which some, uh, especially people new to vampire, new storytellers, might want a little more hand-holding. Uh, but I think it, it really does give you more than it seems like on the surface, or it seems like little blurbs for a scene to where, for example, a D&D module is really going to break down like room by room and all this stuff and really just hold your hand through every step of the way. This does encourage you and require you really um, to flesh it out a bit on your own. Um, but again, it, it does the heavy lifting for you. It really gives you a strong scaffolding. So everything else is just sort of uh, set dressing for you to put on. And it, at first, I, I went back and forth with this, where personally, I think this is a much better way of doing things, but I'm very experienced with this. I was trying to think of this from a new storyteller perspective, and I could see some of them thinking it's lacking a little bit for essentially like the scene selections or the scene descriptions, but I think that's just an initial reaction. I do think once you sort of read what they have um, and just trust yourself a little bit, if you're creative at all, uh, I think you'll you'll do a much better job than you realize. And it does the hard part for you, or it does what I think is more useful. It, it talks to you as a storyteller. It's not written in a way for you, the storyteller, to just regurgitate back to your party. It gives you what you need, tells you, uh, gives you advice, gives, lets you know different motivations and different things to consider and some dice rolls to do, um, and then lets you sort of make it come to life. And this will make you a better storyteller, too. I, I think modules, again, I'll go, going back to some other games, could be a, a bit of a crutch that really don't let you stretch your, your DM storyteller muscles. I think this gives you just enough to sort of guide you and gives you practical and useful advice and will let you improve your skills as you get through this chronicle. And then there's variations. Uh, another example of the writers looking out for different takes or different directions that each story could go into, which again means things don't have to go a certain way uh, a lot. And it's nice that they sort of predicted maybe some of the more obvious or more common ways they thought um, the story they'd written could vary as intended or different details that could be involved with their character that might sort of throw things for a loop. For example, if, uh, a story assumes that uh, the coterie doesn't know a character involved. Um, it's written that way. But there's a possibility maybe one of your players or one of your characters chose um, that character as a sire. Um, so they'll have a variation of saying, okay, so if, if you do know this character, if your coder does know the character, or if it's their sire, um, here's how to handle that. But it's really cool that they sort of they, they wrote their story and instead of trying to make it just like so airtight and like where it has to go a certain way or the, to eliminate any way for it to vary, they're like, no, those variations will happen. Here's a few we can think of already and here's our advice on what to do with it. Of course, I can't predict all of them, but even the few that they cover and they do this for each story, I think is pretty useful. Then we move on to chapter three, the free and the bold. This chapter has stories that start to explore the factions. Uh, the next three chapters each covers a faction. This covers the Anarchs. The stories in this chapter will introduce the Anarch gangs, explore tension between them and the Camarilla. Um, you'll meet the leaders, you'll establish a domain, and you'll get involved with the Anarch politics. There's a section called Presenting the Anarchs. This gives advice on what to highlight about the sect and their general outlook and just sort of vibes. There's also a section about um, their general opinions on the Camarilla. And then it goes into sort of uh, advice and how to get the point across that the, 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 the Anarch's thing that separates them the most is their approach to mortals, how they're more connected to the mortal world and a little ingrained in it. Then there's a section on the gangs. There's three major gangs in this chronicle. They are the Night Forum, which are idealists uh, against the Camarilla, is sort of one equal access to mortal society. There's the Thrill Kill Gang, which shockingly are uh, your, your violent anarch bikers that kind of want to make the most of uh, their knights as kindred. There's the Circle of Mercy. These are vampires who see closeness to mortals. For 
spiritual, and maybe even survival reasons. All of these fall under a general anarch philosophy, but each is a different way to sort of, or a different angle to sort of look at it. And even if your coterie's outlook doesn't exactly line up with any of these gangs, and it probably won't, um, again, it's about sort of finding commonalities or understanding that these are flawed groups. And then also the very real uh, threat of if you don't have a sect or faction to protect you, um, you're very much at risk. So just having at least mutual protection is a big motivator to join someone. Then there's chapter four, the aristocracy of the night. Shockingly, this one is about the Camarilla. These stories involve attending Elysium, uh, being tested by the elite, uh, claiming a sought after domain, hosting a party, and going on a blood hunt is presenting the Camarilla. Um, again, this gives advice on how to introduce the Camarilla, how to give a, a nuanced impression of them, uh, their general outlook and vibes. Uh, it tells you their general outlook and opinion on the Anarchs. And then um, some advice on how to either make them more alluring or more awful, depending on how it serves your chronicle. Then they have a couple of sections called adjoining the Camarilla and benefits of Camarilla membership. Uh, has an interesting take where it notes the, uh, well, the, the paradox, the conflict that the um, now in fifth edition, the Camarilla are, it is an exclusive sect where before is sort of, they just assumed if you're in our city, you are one of us. Uh, and now that's, it's true, but not true in an interesting, complicated way. Because they still demand, if you're in their domain, you have to follow all of the rules, and they have many of them. Um, but that doesn't mean they're going to let you in. You're not necessarily part of the tower, even though you still have to follow rules as if you are. Um, so this section sort of deals with that interesting conflict. And it also gives reasons of why there's uh, the benefits of if you are a full member of the Camarilla, uh, how that gives you access to certain things and uh, the privileges that come along with that rather than just being in their domain. I think this is a pretty useful way to present them. Again, not just in this chronicle, but just in general. There's a section called the Prince of the City. So this chronicle does have a prince and a primogen council, but they haven't asserted dominion over the entire city, um, mostly thanks in part to the Anarchs. So. While they exist, they're purposely uh, kept pretty vague and very weak, at least politically, and just completely uninterested in the coterie or what the coder, this brand new coterie might be up to, even if they end up going with the Camarilla. Again, this is an introductory chronicle it's designed to sort of give you some of the core ideas of uh, Vampire the Masquerade. Um, once you start consorting with the prince and doing all that, that's a whole nother level and that also becomes a, that's a straight Camarilla Chronicle. So they purposely avoid that in this. They're there, but they're background setting rather than active participants in your coterie story. Now the sheriff, on the other hand, they might be meeting the sheriff. There's chapter five, Cain's Angels. This chapter covers the Church of Cain. So they're presented here in a really interesting way. Before it's, again, you're, you're an Anarch or a Camarilla, uh, on a Tarkus, which is an independent, but uh, it's not a whole lot you can do as that as a coterie in, in a lot of chronicles. Um, how they present the Church of Cain as a joinable faction in this is you still are Anarch or Camarilla, but you could be that and Church of Cain. The, the Church accepts, uh, or a Tarkus, or independence. They accept all. In this chronicle, it's the only sort of other option. It's the only faction that still has enough power and members to where it can protect its own um, without the coterie having to firmly be loyal to the Anarchs or Camarilla. And if you're a veteran storyteller, um, this is a, kind of a wild concept. This is not, we're not, we haven't really seen this in other things. The Church of Cain is a, a cult that's presented in Cults of the Blood Gods. The fact that they're presented as a full faction you can join, like, alongside the Camarilla or Anarchs uh, has a lot of really interesting implications. Um, it really got me thinking about, yeah, if there's a, a group or a cult or anything like that, if they grow big enough in your setting, in your city, there's no reason why 
Um, you couldn't present a third or even fourth option if your city's big enough to hold all these factions um, as a, a, a joinable thing by your whole coterie. Now, it also makes sense that that's kind of rare. Uh, most domains, most major cities are already sort of claimed by one of the two major sides. And either one probably isn't super uh, keen on the idea of a uh, religious or cult or movement or anything like that suddenly growing in enough power to be considered its own faction, really. But who knows what happens in your game? Now, the stories in this chapter involve uh, attending a a service at the Church of Cain, um, mediating a problem between them and the Anarchs, uh, converting members potentially or protecting current ones, uh, participating in secret rituals to officially join the church, uh, and a sort of murder mystery. There's a section called A Resurgence of Faith. Um, this gives a quick rundown on the history of the Church of Cain and the roles of its members. They sort of have a, a hierarchy. It's organized into the congregation, doorkeepers, acolytes, and the priest. A more in-depth look at this cult um, can also be found in Cults of the Blood God. So if you have access to that, um, and then they also get into it more in some of the supplements with Cults of the Blood Gods, definitely worth checking those out too. Then there's presenting the Church of Cain. Um, like the other presenting the whatever, it kind of gives you a, a, the general rundown on what the group's about. Um, but they break it down in an interesting way for the Church of Cain. They give them different themes that can be adjusted depending on what you think your coterie might be interested in. The ones they give them are uh, faith, myth, guidance, and power. So the Church of Cain can kind of represent, a, all, they all represent all of these things, but you can kind of lean into one or the other if you think it'll be more enticing or interesting to your players uh, or the Chronicle as a whole. What this means is uh, the Gnostics, as they're sometimes referred to as, um, can either be a, a means for the characters to find community, uh, to seek answers to sort of the philosophical questions of uh, what it means to be a vampire, or some of like the lore, the mythology questions of like where, where they come from, what the curse is, or is it a curse? Um, and also sort of guidance on how to manage one's beasts and humanity. And that covers uh, all the stories are contained in those. So even if you again just pick and join one of the sex um doesn't mean the other chapters of uh faction stories are cut off for you they're just going to be approached in a different way um they're all designed to things get very non-linear very modular on purpose at that point so where you can jump from chapter to chapter with different stories um maybe introduce all of them uh, with some of their early stuff and then as they get pulled into the different directions and or as they pick a domain that'll open up either more opportunities with some factions, cut off some others, or give them a unique approach to some of the other faction stories. So it's meant to play to round with, and they have some flow charts and things like that too to sort of uh, help you figure out how to arrange these things. Then there's uh, the first appendix is feeding complications. There's a chart of all the predator types um, that are found in the core book and player's guide, as well as it gives you their predator roles. Again, a quick reference thing for storytellers. Um, and then each predator type has one to three scenes with complications that can arise uh, during a feeding scene associated with that type. And these are usually kind of a quick, simple, um, but can really go uh, turn into much bigger things depending on how they're handled. They usually do a paragraph or two to set up the scene um, and then a test to uh, let you know what dice or mechanics might be involved in overcoming that problem. There's Appendix 2, which is plug and play scenes. These are a collection of short scenes that are each connected to a specific setting or location. These aren't the same specific, like named locations that are in the beginning of the Chronicle. These are more generic. Um, they're examples as like an abandoned warehouse or uh, the sewers or Elysium or a fairground, sort of general stuff that you can easily plug into either this Chronicle or other Chronicles. And then each one has sort of a setup or an event that can happen there. Um, then there's a section called what's really happening at the event, which kind of gives you the, the other angle of what's going on there, usually a problem or obstacle to deal with. Uh, and then a test section to, again, give you some of the mechanics that might be involved in navigating this scene. Then the final section is the third appendix, uh, future stories. These are a collection of uh, short stories, and 
there are things that could be used to continue the chronicle. So if you're having a great time, uh, the group really wants to stick with their characters here and keep going. These are some things you can f tack on the end of it to help transition into the next sort of major arc of your chronicle. Uh, and not only do they give you, again, just kind of the basics, what you need to set up these scenes, they give advice on how to adapt them depending on what faction your coterie ended up in. And that's it for going section by section, chapter by chapter of the book. I um, guess it's time to tell you my, I've already given you my opinion on it, but I'll, I'll talk more because I, it's, it's what I do here make videos that could be short and make them long because I'm not good at being concise, but it's okay. So while this book doesn't serve a huge purpose for me personally, um, I love that it exists. I think this is exactly what fifth edition needed. Um, I hope they do this with every line. They, they should do this with werewolf. They should do this with hunter, um, future lines, mage. Um, I think this should be one of the first things they do is create an introductory chronicle uh, designed in pretty much the exact same way to sort of help storytellers hit sort of the major themes and concepts involved in the game and let them learn how to be a storyteller and give really good advice while also giving the players a, a really cool guided but not restrictive introduction to the game world of darkness doesn't lend itself very well to books like to modules um or at least i thought this sort of proved me wrong a little bit everything i like about the game is also why it doesn't make for a, a great modules because again things are I, I think should be character driven and involve a lot of personal narratives and things like that so how do you like pre plan or have a packaged game that's going to hit the personal motivations of whatever characters any random group of people might create right it's, it's impossible um there's not like classic adventures to go on or things like that it should be very different and reflect the journeys of the the vampires the characters involved but this is a good way to do that you do you don't worry about a really strict linear story you have a bunch of modular, smaller stories that each have a, a goal in mind. A, a, the goal isn't necessarily a big plot goal as much as this is a great scene to introduce them to feeding. or This is a great scene um, to let them show off their disciplines or this will show them politics or this will show them this side of the camera. Like that sort of design and, and creating a story works so much better for this and is really one of the only ways to do it. I really like all the storyteller advice, all just the direct, like, uh, the writers talking to you as a storyteller, and it, it's a different narrative tone than a lot of other books take, even other vampire books, and it's, it's necessary for something like this, and much, much more useful, especially for a new storyteller. Again, I like everything in my life, I learned the hard way how to do this game, but man, this would have been so nice to have when starting off. And what I really hope is that this is going to, there's a bit of a barrier to this, especially, um, I mean, D and D is what 80% of the market, if not more, like that's most people's introduction to TTRPGs. And a lot of people never move on from that. Um, coming from that to this, it could be kind of jarring with the, uh, choice paralysis, essentially, if like that, your, your backstory, your narrative, your character's desires mean so much more and your decisions mean so much more than just like. Uh, what you do in combat. So it could be a lot and it's harder to story tell because it involves a lot more uh, understanding of stories. You're not building encounters. You're not balancing monster abilities and levels and things like that. You are a collaborative storyteller with your players. And that could be, that's scary. That's daunting. That requires a lot more creativity um, that I think might be intimidating to a lot of people new storytellers uh, even if they, they don't have any ttrpg background um so a, a book like this which gives you just enough but also doesn't uh, lets you put your own spin on it lets it, you make it your own enough to where like you as a storyteller get attached to it i don't think this chronicle will feel like oh i ran crimson gutter 
And that's going to mean something so different to each person who does it because it's kind of impossible for it to go the same way each time. And again, all the in-between sessions between the stories that will likely happen. It's not meant to just you run one story, then run the other story, then run a different story. It's meant to allow the breathing spaces and things to develop and the characters to uh, chase their own goals uh, between these stories or during these stories. Uh, and that's that's the way to do it. That's that's vampire. That's world of darkness. That's again what I thought would make it hard to do something like this. They they proved me wrong. I'm. So glad they did. I think they did a very good job of hitting the key themes of the game too, right? Like the, the feeding experience, uh, the personal horror, the political horror, the uh, very flawed, not only individuals, but flawed factions. Um, and then they give you that. I think that was a really smart idea to add the Church of Cain because it gives you an opportunity to explore the, the myth, the lore, the legends, the philosophy of being a vampire as well in an intriguing way. So kind of it, pretty much any itch a player will have, they can scratch um, with their choices in this. And that's great because that means this has the potential to really hook a new group of players uh, onto, I could, I could easily see people continuing on after this chronicle and this leading into a large expansive one that uh, by the time they get through this, I think the players and storyteller will be pretty confident and their abilities and hopefully want to keep going. And that's, that's the goal. That's what we want, right? We want more uh, people in the world of darkness. We want more vampires. Now, uh, I'll be honest, this isn't a must have uh, for veterans, especially if you can really like just doing you know, like you, you know, you know, this game, um, you have a very specific concept of mind, mind, or you just, you're, your group does and you really like just letting the group take the lead and especially if you have a group of experienced players um an introductory chronicle like this um yeah the, they'll sort of they'll know what's going on it'll some of the mystique and oh cool we're learning what a why it is we're learning this players who know all that stuff it's not going to wow them quite as much again the the writing in this book isn't the intention isn't to be like, hey, this is some like wild plots happening. I do think they're they're good. Um, but again, it's uh, they, they expect a storyteller to sort of uh, add their flavor and really uh, spice them up. So if you have a experienced group and they want to play through this, I don't think they'll have a bad time. Because again, even if they'll sort of, they already get the concepts, it's always interesting to kind of go back and... and Again, if, if you're playing this game, that means you enjoy those concepts and you should like sort of having those scenes and having those introductions. Because even though you as a player have been introduced to it, um, your character hasn't. And it's cool approaching that in different ways. But again, not necessarily a must have. If you've got your own chronicle going, grabbing this isn't really going to give you a lot of new options or mechanics or things to add. Um, it can be used as a toolbox, though. If you're someone who's always like looking for things for inspiration, or just uh, if a list of NPCs just is something that's useful to you, or locations. Um, and again, a lot of these stories are designed to be adaptable, where you can just kind of plop them into any chronicle, and they probably would make sense with some adjustments. Uh, if you're someone who's just always looking for a little bit more to grab from, you're. There's, there's always something to get out of this. Like I said, I've, I've been doing this for uh, a long time. I've ran so many games. The Vampire the Masquerade, uh, one of the best in the business. Um, yeah, that's kind of right. But uh, even I was picking up things and learn, learning things or some of their advice was still relevant to me. So again, yeah, not a must have if you're like really know what you're not, it's not even know what you're doing. If you've already like got your game and are playing it, um, again, it's not a ton of need for this, but uh, it's not a waste either. Now, if you're a new storyteller, and even more so if you have a group of new players, uh, this is a, a godsend. You can use this wholesale. Uh, you're gonna get. You're gonna every page of this book is gonna be useful to you in some way, um, or even it's if you do have an idea for your own story that you're 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 kind of want to do uh 
this still is going to be a very, very good foundation for it. So even if you're like, I don't know what to run, I'll, I'll run this. You could do that. And that's awesome. That does takes away a lot of the, the prep work that can be daunting, especially as a brand new storyteller. Uh, but say even you have an idea, this probably won't really alter it. It's really easy to take any idea and uh, incorporate it into this chronicle. So again, if you're a new storyteller, if you have a new group of players, like I can't think of a reason not to get this again, unless you're just, I don't know. I don't, like I said, it's a, a huge, huge thing for new, new storytellers, new players. And I really hope and think it will, uh, help a lot of people who've maybe been waffling or a little nervous or intimidated of jumping in doing this will like really help you just like go for it. Because again, I, I think it's going to give you everything you need to give you the confidence to run a game and do a lot of the work for you in a way that so lets you do a lot of the fun stuff if that makes sense. So yeah, those are my thoughts. Um, this also kind of got me thinking about my first uh, chronicle I ran of uh, fifth edition, which some of you may have seen. Um, I was, I, I, I think they're around somewhere. Also, I think I might have unlisted them because the production was terrible. Story, I stand behind. Players are amazing. Uh, I threw some interesting things on. But man, was it different than this. I definitely did not do a, uh, I, I definitely didn't hit a lot of the core concepts. And I specifically was doing a sort of different angle on Vampire, which probably not the best idea for introducing all my players are new to they haven't played any vampire let alone fifth edition uh but it worked out and again i've been running games and i've ran the old edition of vampire i've done it forever so i felt confident doing that uh, i think if i would have had this though i definitely would have used quite a bit of it so i'm really curious and that got me thinking just in general i think some other games a lot of people's like first campaigns will obviously be different in what happened, but I think like the formula of them is probably somewhat similar. And I, I, I would love to hear people's like first Chronicle stories with Vampire, because I think this game uh, might differ a lot more than others. Again, one of the reasons I love this system and setting. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious if you have any stories about your first Chronicle, just kind of the gist of it. Like what, what was that setup? What was... What did you accomplish? What was the, the themes or ideas behind it? Um, be interested to see how much it varies. Or if weirdly there is sort of a, a kind of traditional uh, arc or story that people have been telling through this that a lot of us weirdly synced up on. I don't know. Curious. Let me know. Um, otherwise, yeah, thanks for sticking through this and hanging in there. Uh, I think, again... Love this this exists. I uh World of Darkness, Renegade, make this for Werewolf. Make it for Werewolf next, because Werewolf's new enough to where uh you are gonna catch a lot of the, the new storytellers with this. I'll make it for Hunter. And then uh when I am working on the official fifth edition mage, I'll make sure to help make this for Mage too. I don't know where my candle is. And those are fake. Uh, you know the drill. This chapter's closed. Roof must send. Thanks for letting me in. Don't forget to close the door. Bye. Go ahead. I know you're going to start scratching again as soon as I start talking. I beg you. I beg you to scratch your scratching posts. You refuse. And now you're all about it. We're done? Okay. Thank you. I will continue. Also, I, I can't do another take every time Crowley, uh, who is my dog, soon to be maybe not my dog, if he keeps going to war with me and not letting me make these. Um, so sometimes you might hear a little yapping in the background. Ignore it, because I, I only have so much time to edit, and um, we're not going to let him win. <laughs>